Hi, everyone. This is Alex Epstein, host of Power Hour. And this week, we've got another best of Power Hour for you. It is with one of my favorite guests and really one of my favorite thinkers in the energy industry environment space. And that is Pierre Desrochers of the University of Toronto. Pierre is a geographer, uh, which is somebody who I don't even know the exact uh, definition, but geographers tend to be good at understanding long-term trends in human life and human populations, including our relationship with the rest of nature. And today we're going to be featuring the first ever episode we did with Pierre, which is, uh, it was called Capitalism and Our Environment. Now, this is a timelessly valuable issue, but it's particularly valuable, or it's particularly at least prominent in my mind right now, because as I've been working on the second version of the moral case for fossil fuels, I've been thinking more and more about how distorted a view of our environment people have. Our environment is viewed as a, a as a delicate nurturer that, left to its own devices, will nourish us and keep us safe and give us the opportunity to have an enjoyable life. But if we de- disrupt it and we, we destabilize the, del- the delicate balance of this delicate nurturer, then we'll have hell to pay. And in this episode, Pierre gives uh, some of the reasons why this is just all wrong. And in particular, he explains the relationship between capitalism, which really means freedom, and a better and better environment for human flourishing. So uh, I always enjoy talking to Pierre. By the way, he has a new book called Population Bombed. Population Bombed. Now, I have not read all of it, I, I, but I read some of it, and it was really good. And he's I just always find his research really, really valuable. So actually talking about it right now motivates me to go read the rest of the book, but definitely check that out. And I hope you enjoy Uh, me talking with Pierre and interviewing Pierre on capitalism and our environment. Also, if you haven't done so already, go to Amazon and order, pre-order your copy of The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. Just search The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels Revised. And also make sure to sign up for my email list at alexepsteinlist.com. That's alexepsteinlist.com. Okay, enjoy. All right, we are here with Pierre Desrochers of the University of Toronto at Pierre, how do you pronounce the local part? Well, I'm actually based in the Mississauga campus, but it's not an art school. You know, at U of T, we pride ourselves, uh, at least that's what our boss at the suburban campuses want us to say. We're really part of the big university. It's just that we're our, our own independent undergraduate unit. So I'm at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. At least that's where my office is. And Mississauga refers, like all the big uh, miss in the United States, Mississippi, Missouri refers to rivers. So we're by the Credit River, just north of Lake Ontario. Uh, got it. Well, I brought you on today because I've wanted you on the show for a while, but especially since this is the month of Earth Day. And uh, for in my own reading and research, you've been one of the most interesting people on the issue of capitalism and environment. So I thought I would bring up um, some of the subjects I've seen you cover. And the one I want to start with is, is maybe the one you're best known for, at least in the circles I've talked about, and that's the issue of waste and recycling. Because we often hear that capitalism leads to this proliferation of waste, and the reason that the environmental movement exists is to pre- prevent this evil, and yet your research uh, shows very much otherwise. Yeah, it's kind of, uh, I started working on these things about uh, 15 years ago. I mean, at the time I was working on the doctoral dissertation. I'm an economic geographer by training. <clears throat> and I assume that won't tell you much to your listeners, but the beauty of being a geographer is that you can pretty much do anything you want any way you want it. So uh, what I was doing 15 years ago in my little sub-discipline of economic geography was to try to understand how um, knowledge developed in one line of work ends up solving problems in another completely different line of work and what role, if any, geographical proximity uh, plays into that. So long story short, the way I went uh, looking at the issue was to talk to a bunch of uh, small businesses and inventors in my own town of Montreal. And I was sort of aware of that because I grew up in a small town and I had worked for small businesses when I was a kid. But again, what struck me was how small business owners and how inventors are genetically engineered in a way that they're completely allergic to waste. 
uh, the, a common characteristic of all the inventors that I talked to was always to find ways to put uh, industrial waste products or waste of any kind to some other good uses. And I was struggling when I began researching my doctoral dissertation because there hadn't been much written uh, on uh, intellectual or uh, technical creativity to, be, to begin with. I mean, you look at the creativity literature and it's all about artists, it's all about scientists, Engineers and technicians are, were not of much interest to that crowd, but I began reading in the history of technology while I was conducting my field work, and I was struck by this pattern uh, throughout history. I mean, in a way, I sort of worked out the, the, the basic insight, which is really not all that glamorous, but that this whole notion of externalities, that it makes sense for business to throw away stuff that they've paid for in the first place, um, is a way to improve your bottom line. So, you know, you buy all sorts of input, you manufacture something out of it, and then obviously you have some unavoidable residual. And instead of trying to come up with some creative way to use it, the economists tell you, or at least this whole externality literature, uh, the belief, it seemed to me, among academics was that, well, it makes so, just so much more sense for a business to just throw it away so that they don't have to handle uh, proper disposal costs. But again, if you know anything about how the mind of creative technicians and engineers work, if you had read a little bit about the history of technology, if you talk to people, if you like that, how business work, I mean, the inventors that I would talk to, a number of them would meet at a local um, waste disposal site every Wednesday to trade, uh, let's say, pieces of aluminum or pieces of scrap under the counter and stuff like that. The whole thing didn't quite make sense to me. So I figured, well, I'm not that smart. So if I've noticed that, I'm sure other people have noticed it too, and even in the dark industrial age where business was not supposed to care about the environment. <laughs> and lo and behold, I realized that there was a huge literature written on that on the 19th century, and a lot of people realized that uh, there was money to be made in that. And it's amazing when you read those 19th century writers, how they go about, well, of course, we have to make trade-offs to improve standards of living. I mean, uh, people are still not very wealthy in the 19th century, but they realize, well, the best way to go about it is to create wealth out of waste. And you had a significant exhibit on that in uh, London in the late 19th century. Uh, you had a uh, very large literature in French. I can read French, so I was able to get into that. Um, there was also a lot about this in German, I'm told, but, obviously, uh, but I don't read German, but some of my friends helped me translate some of that stuff. So I just went down and uh, documented how, you know, this whole concept of externalities, this whole notion that it makes sense to business to just throw away stuff that they've paid for, is just complete nonsense. So it's what's, it was kind of hard for me to get it published in the academic literature, but eventually I succeeded. So yeah, so that's my that's one of my little contributions to uh, the field of innovation studies, if I might call it that. Um, I've seen I've seen a couple of PowerPoint presentations of yours where you go into a couple of examples. Could you describe maybe one of the more concrete examples of this in practice, maybe in the 19th century? Sure. Okay, so let's see. Uh, perhaps the most significant advance in the 19th century was the, how people dealt uh, with coal tar. So uh, perhaps in Europe, people understand this better in the UK because you still have leftover from that period, but not so much in the United States. Anyway, long story short, uh, before um, natural gas came along, uh, gas, it's a slightly different type of gas, but bear with me here, uh, in the cities was literally manufactured, and meaning essentially that people would just uh, gather uh, coal and they would essentially cook it and get some gas out of it, which was then distributed in uh, nearby city neighborhoods. I mean, oil oil was more popular in the countryside, but in city, gaslight uh, was very significant in the 19th century. So you would get some, you would get some gas out of that, which was uh, truly awful at first because it would be full of sulfur and other things. Uh, you would pump it into the houses and you read the earliest accounts and uh, basically it makes the air unbreathable, it tarnishes everything and stuff. But people realize, okay, what are our problems here? Well, sulfur and other things. And so People found a way to scrub the gas in a way to get the bad stuff out of it, and eventually the quality was such that it became a successful product. But the most, the worst residual that they would get would be some sort of tar-like uh, substance at the end of the distillation, uh, distillation process. So at first, people tried to uh, dump it in rivers, but then neighbors complained through common laws they cannot do that. They tried to burn it, uh, but it makes a really horrible smoke, and coal gas is manufactured in cities. Uh, neighbors won't tolerate it. They try to bury it, and it kills everything around, and it might seep into you know local wells and local water sources, so that doesn't work either. But eventually, out of this, what is often described as the filthiest, foulest uh, residual of all, 
uh, our modern synthetic world was born. I mean, everything today that is manufactured out of petroleum was, if it existed in the 19th century, uh, at first manufactured uh, from uh, coal tar. So everything from uh, disinfectants, uh, hundreds, literally hundreds of uh, products were made out of this, uh, dyes, synthetic dyes, among other things. And it was by far, I think, the most significant advance. I mean, I found some uh, flow charts with describe, which describes the hundreds of products that were manufactured out of a waste that uh, nobody what to do with uh, at first. But then I've also documented uh, every line of work that you can think of. Again, things that we take for granted today, uh, slag. You know, you would produce steel. The portion that isn't the ore in it per se was just like a big pile of dust that people didn't know what to do with at first. And the black country in England got uh, that name because it became covered with piles of slags. But then people realized that, well, if you deal with it when it is hot, you can actually make a very uh, acceptable uh, fake stone out of it. So a lot of buildings that look like they're built out of stone are actually built out of slag, which at first people didn't know what to do. Then they realized that, well, we can actually pave road with the stuff, and it's cheaper than mining stuff in quarries. So... Um, so slag is something that I've documented. I mean, uh, mineral wool came out of slag, too. I mean, there were many other things. Um, the uh, food industry, obviously, was like any other line of work. The great uh, meatpacking establishments of Chicago. Uh, now, of course, people today imagine that it was all built on greed and they succeeded by crushing their uh, smaller competitors. Uh, well, no, if you look at the history, the advantage of the big Chicago packers is that, like in any line of work where you can gather large quantities of residuals, you have a strong incentive to make stuff out of it. So uh, your uh, listeners are probably familiar with the old expression, everything but the squeal was used in Chicago. But that wasn't so at first. I mean, people had to find various ways to use stuff. So you read about the, for the earliest days of that industry, and what would happen was that the meatpacker would be left with the unedible and non letter portion of the animal. They would go out of the city and they would bury it. And then at night, the glue manufacturers would come over, dig up the stuff, turn it into glue. But eventually, these people found ways to connect with each other. And eventually, again, hundreds of byproducts were manufactured out of uh, animals' leftovers, essentially. So a lot of things that are made out of uh, plastics today were at one point in time made out of animal bones. And the advantages that the Chicago Packers had is that they were handling uh, much larger volumes of materials then they're smaller competitors. I mean, small butcher shops across America would not develop wealth out of waste. They simply did not have the infrastructure, the know-how, the volumes. But part of the success of Chicago and the, the, uh, the, uh, the item, if you will, that made the difference between profits and losses and which gave them the opportunity to lower the price of meat and make it more accessible was their tremendous capacity to develop uh, wealth out of waste. And basically, you look at every line of work um, – in a competitive market economy historically, long before the birth of Greenpeace, long before the birth of the environmental movement, people found ways to uh, create wealth out of waste in every line of work because it was good for their uh, bottom line and accessorily, well, you know, it made them more acceptable to neighbors, but uh, the motivation really uh, was economic. You mentioned um, earlier on your view in contrast to the prevailing view of externalities, which in this context has to do with capitalism will inevitably generate all of this harmful waste that the system doesn't fairly uh, account for. And so it seems like one, a key insight here is that uh, uh, there's an economic incentive to whenever possible to monetize the waste. It, uh, I'm curious what you think about the following. It seems like there's also inevitably going to be situations where you can't monetize the waste, but where the externality argument is invalid because you simply protect property rights and therefore people have a legal obligation not to pollute their neighbors with undesirable waste. Yeah, I think that the problem with the externality literature, and again, I'm a geographer, I'm not an economist, but I've been reading and talking to, I've been reading economic literature and talking to economists for a long time. The point that seems to be missing uh, among economists is um, any basic notion of entrepreneurial uh, drive and technological creativity, but also the fact that these things take time. So if you look at the history of the developments that I've told you uh, about, there was always a strong economic incentive. I mean, people wanted to create as much value uh, as they could out of what they touch. But uh, private property rights didn't matter historically. I mean, a lot of these businesses uh, were uh, shut down uh, by uh, common law under, uh, I mean, uh, private property rights uh, in the early 19th century. So 
you not only add an economic incentive to do something about it, and to, um, but also uh, one that came from the protection of uh, surrounding property rights. Now, uh, what often happened, too, is that at first, when people could not make money out of their waste, they at least had an incentive uh, to neutralize it. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, Canada was not so different uh, than many other countries in that respect. A number of uh, business interests uh, often also subverted uh, the status quo and managed somehow to trample property rights. But again, I think laying the blame in that case to capitalism or free mar- or free markets is kind of wrong. I mean, it was a failure of uh, the political process. But yeah, no, property rights were extremely strong in the 19th century, and uncreative businesses went under because they were unable uh, to create wealth out of waste. But those that were more efficient, those that were more creative, eventually were able to, again, appease their neighbors and make more money in the process. Could you contrast this, or compare and contrast it might be, this attitude toward what we might call uh, recycling to the modern view of recycling, which to my knowledge in many cases encourages things that are very, very wasteful uh, energy-wise and otherwise? Well, actually, the word recycling uh, came from the oil refining business, and it was part of you know re- recycling water and stuff. People in the 19th century talked about uh, byproducts and uh, byproduct development. But, you know, two bad things have happened since then. Uh, the first is that people don't uh, differentiate between industrial and domestic waste. A reason why business can create wealth out of waste is that, um, if I may use that word, their residuals are kind of uh, uniform and of high quality. And what I mean by that is that you get a high volume, a large volume of essentially the same stuff. So you can break down its chemical composition. You can look to see what might be valuable in it or what might need to be added to it to turn it into something useful. Domestic waste, by contrast, have always been trickier. I mean, it's a bunch of different things that are mixed up uh, together. So the economics of it have always been very different. Now, the two bad things that have happened in the last century is that uh, increasingly the sort of uh, waste as problem rather than waste as opportunity has taken over um, the approach that many regulatory agencies have taken. So without getting into detail, suffice it to say that in the United States now it is often more difficult to recycle uh, waste than it was uh, several decades ago because now you don't look at things as production residuals that might have uh, potentially useful uh, uses, but you look at them as dangerous waste that must be discarded. So by law in the United States, if something is labeled a hazardous waste, you have no choice but to destroy it. Whereas its chemical composition might be very similar to a very valuable chemical input, it's just that you need to extract the stuff from it or maybe add something to it, and then... uh, Chemically, it would be identical to something that is valuable, but by law, its destruction is mandated. Now, another problem is that, again, uh, ecologists or environmental activists think that, you know, nobody thought of recycling before they did, and that somehow we must be uh, made uh, feel guilty about uh, the way we consume things. So this is why, even though there's absolutely no economic or environmental cases to be made, for uh, recycling domestic waste as opposed to, let's say, incinerating it and creating some energy out of it or uh, putting it in a landfill until a future generation figure out ways to do something out of this very low-value residual. Uh, We sort of sponsor, um, well, we do uh, waste a lot of money on domestic waste recycling when there's no economic or uh, rationale benefit to it. Uh, Unfortunately, my city of Toronto has long been a pioneer in that But, uh, you know, talk to people who are in that line of work privately and they will tell you, well, either it doesn't make sense or else there would be a better way to handle that waste, which would be, let's say, import technologies from the mining industry, which uh, sorts a lot of uh, material on its own, if you will, without having people involved. And you would actually lose less money doing things that way. I'm not saying you would actually earn money, but you would lose less money. But Environmental activists are adamantly opposed to that because it seems to me their real goal in life is to make people feel guilty about their consumption. Whereas you can actually uh, consume stuff, you know, a plastic package, for example, plastic packaging burns very well in incinerator. It's a very good feedstock. You could create electricity out of it. That might be the most uh, sensible way to handle uh, things where, let's say, disposal uh, costs are high. But they won't have any of that. You know, they they have this basic notion that we need to... Uh, recover this stuff. But then they forget that recycling is a manufacturing process like any other. I mean, you need energy, you need efforts to sort the stuff, you need a market for it. Uh, Fortunately, in the last few years, places like China have been more interested 
in uh, buying our garbage. So some things now do travel long distances, but many activists are going to run happy with that because they think that, well, the waste should be used locally. So uh, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that industrial waste recycling and domestic waste recycling are two completely different things, and you should not derive insights from one into another. Uh, I think, uh, and there's uh, there's definitely a couple of just the basic uh, components of the green philosophy here. Because even if, even if you take something like a plastic bottle that you use domestically, let's say that there's no there's no current known way of doing it. There's this there's kind of two views here. One is this moral view that it's somehow wrong to do it if we're not going to be able to reuse it. But in reality, it was just oil sitting under the ground not doing anything, and we got a beneficial use out of it. In my view, if it's put in a landfill indefinitely, that's fine. But there's this view that, well, the consumer resource is scarce, so there's only a certain amount of energy or you know, synthetic product feedstock that will ever exist, and therefore we're taking it from Mother Nature, which is, I think, wrong, as we've discussed in this program. Um, and then... Oh, I lost my train of thought, but it's... it's so oh, okay. well, let me just jump in, though. There's something I need to add. Uh, plastic, people don't realize, was part of that great cycle of creating wealth out of waste. I mean, the origin of the modern plastic industry came from uh, the cracking of the extraction of gasoline out of petroleum. Uh, gasoline was a very dangerous uh, waste product at first because it's very volatile. It tends to blow up in your face very easily. The internal combustion engine uh, took care of that. But when people began extracting gasoline out of petroleum, which the gasoline which they used to throw away at first, they were left with some NAFTA from the process, uh, from the creation of high-quality gasoline. And NAFTA eventually became the feedstock for the plastic industry. So uh, plastics were actually a way to recover uh, production residuals in the petroleum refining industry. Now, plastic had a number of advantages over other things. It essentially killed uh, the market for um, animal bones, which, you know, uh, chest sets, for example, a century ago would have been, ba- uh, I mean, uh, not the ones for uh, European royalty, obviously, but just that for common people would have been made out of bones. But plastics displaced a bunch of other things because, um, well, for a plastic bottle, for example, is much lighter than a glass bottle. So it saves you a lot of energy in terms of moving stuff. And uh, being essentially derived from, uh, but there are different kinds of plastics, I mean, different grades and different qualities. The problem historically is that because you had all these different kinds of plastics which were used um, in uh, houses, you could not mix them all together and get a good quality product out of it. So the old joke was that the only thing that you would create out of uh, recycled domestic plastics were the blue boxes or plastic boxes that you would uh, use for recycling. But uh, the thing is that plastic had a number of advantages over other alternatives. It can be manufactured out of natural gas. It can be manufactured out of uh, petrol uh, refining uh, residuals. It had a number of advantages over the products that it replaced. I mean, the plastic bottles, plastic containers in uh, less advanced economies have always been described as, you know, little miracles because even kids can now uh, transport water, whereas things were made out of clay, uh, things were just too heavy. But uh, the point that I'm trying to make here is that uh, plastics can be a good feedstock for incinerators, and there have been different ways uh, discovered over time to recycle it. But plastic is an abundant uh, things. I mean, uh, I assume you've discussed peak oil and those other theories on your show before. We're not about to uh, run out of uh, carbon fuels anytime soon. And this whole notion that we're about to run out of plastic or that we should recycle it, when recycle it is a complex process that actually often burns more energy and uh, is more wasteful overall than simply creating electricity out of uh, the plastic bottles, is just another issue where, again, emotion trumps uh, basic engineering and basic economics. So <laughs> I think I've lost my train of thought too, but uh, no, the point that, I wanted to make is that... Yeah. Oh, no, no, go, sorry. Go go for it. Oh, no, 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 no. All I, all I wanted to say is that, unfortunately, this is another one of those issues where uh, it's funny, you see uh, a number of environmental activists complaining about petroleum, but of course, the device that they held are made out of petroleum, the nylon stocking, or, you know... Um, Material, uh, the material that their, uh, some of uh, their dresses or their clothes are made of are derived from petroleum. The, co- the cosmetic they wear might be made out of petroleum. Uh, the water bottle that they bring, you know, for, uh, fine, they might not have brought, uh, bought the bottle at the local corner store. They might have put tap water into it, but their bottle is made out of petroleum. And, you know, uh, carbon fuels have been a real boon to humanity in the last uh, century and a half. People don't realize in most cases 
how much we owe to them. And as you say, I mean, having left them in the ground uh, would just have made us so much more miserable. I mean, uh, you know, prosthetic limbs. Uh, you're born in a hospital to the you're surrounded by plastics. Uh, you die in a hospital, you're again surrounded by plastics. They, they've improved uh, humanity's quality of life in so many ways. And then people just don't understand that there are no real substitutes to petroleum in our uh, in our current state of uh, technological knowledge. So no, thing, uh, so we're not about to run out of it anytime soon. Plastics were great, but we should not take a religious approach towards uh, the stuff that we consume. We should take a more um, engineering and economic based uh, approach to it. And prices do send us very useful signals. I mean, if the Chinese and others are happy to buy our plastic, fine, let's ship it there. It tells you that uh, it can be uh, used uh, more. Uh, it can be used. Uh, more efficiently there, despite uh, being moved over long distances. But then at the same time, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's very difficult to have a rational discussion about these things. So, yeah. Well, as, as listeners, I'm sure I can tell by this point, one, one reason why I wanted to bring you on the show is because you have um, just a, a really great knowledge of history of these things and have all these great examples, which I, I think is so refreshing even among the free market energy people. Uh, and so I just, I love every example because I, I learned so much and I can add it to my own, my own stockpile. So I'm going to ask you a very selfish question now because it's, it's on my own favorite topic, but I'm sure you have some great examples of it. And this is the issue of the relationship between energy and environment. I think people radically underappreciate how bad our environment was, say, 200, 250 years ago before the advent of modern carbon-based fuel um, combustion. And so could you speak to that, especially as we're heading toward Earth Day and how much better our environment has become and how that connects to energy? Oh, sure. Well, you see, the beauty of being a geographer is that I can uh, teach and research about a lot of stuff that I have an interest in. So uh, one, of the, one of my lectures is about the history of deforestation. Now, people take for granted that, you know, well, historically there wasn't much deforestation and then big multinationals came along and started chopping down the Amazon forest. Uh, well, no, I mean, you read people who actually know about the stuff and there are actually a few geographers among them. And they will tell you that roughly 90% of deforestation in history occurred before 1950. What people don't realize today is that before the era of cheap, abundant energy, uh, humanity was not very productive. I mean, historically, the most uh, what powered most things were human and animal muscles, and you might have you know a few water mills here and there, and sailboats and windmills. But these things were not very productive. So what happened is that to achieve very little, people needed a huge amount of land. So you don't have, for example, um, nitrogen fertilizers to grow crops. Well, you need a lot of space. To grow very, uh, to get very low yields of wheat or barley or corn or whatever it was uh, that people were growing, you don't have abundant energy. Well, you cannot move things around all that much, so you need to produce your food locally, but in very bad conditions. I mean, growing wheat on hilly slopes or rocky terrain or something like that. So before uh, carbon fuels came along, what happened is that you had very low productivity agricultural practices uh, the world over, and when you're stuck growing food in environments that are not very well suited to it, you not only deforest it, but typically over time you ruin the land. So if you go around the Mediterranean world today, you see a very dry landscape, uh, rocks everywhere. Well, this is the result of low productivity agriculture over thousands of years. I mean, people are running goats around, people having uh, cut down the fuel because they had no alternative to heat themselves or create some light uh, in the evening, no other alternatives to cook their meat. So uh, humanity's impact on uh, the environment is typically much greater than people nowadays realize because you would need to burn the landscape repeatedly, among other things. I mean, we read today, let's say, awful report about Indonesia telling us that people are burning the landscape or what have you. Well, I can show you paintings from 19th century Europe where people were burning the black forest regularly. I mean, the process was the same in Scandinavia. When you have low productivity land, what you tend to do is that you chop down the wood that you can and then you burn the landscape so that you get two or three uh, crops out of it, which are not very productive. Then you move on, you chop the wood, you burn the landscape and such. And what happened with the advent of carbon fuel is that uh, marginal agricultural land could be abandoned and left alone. So coal essentially saved uh, forests uh, the world over in the 19th century. There was much less of an incentive 
to burn down trees. Uh, what happened before is that only poor uh, poor people would burn coal. Coal coal would fill your house with uh, smoke and uh, mono- uh, carbon monoxide, toxic gas. So only poor, desperate people would burn it. Wealthy people would burn wood. But then new technologies were created that allowed people to burn coal more cleanly. And overnight, uh, pressures on forests to provide fuel at any rate uh, went down drastically. And then cheap energy in the form of the steam engine, which was uh, taken out of the mines and put on the railroads and uh, steamboats, allowed people to grow food where it was the most suitable uh, places, to, in the most suitable places to do so. So people stopped eroding the landscape by growing, again, cereal grains in places where it should not have been grown. And then uh, production in Australia, Argentina, Canada, the United States took off and so a lot of uh, land was allowed to reforest. Another drastic advantage of carbon fuel is um, that they made the city air much more breathable. I mean, historically, again, people don't realize that uh, burning low-quality fuel in your household was the worst thing that you could do. I mean, you would not only bring uh, breed carbon dioxide, but also all sorts of other, t- other stuff that would give you lung disease, that would drastically uh, shorten your quality of life. And the burning of low-quality fuel is still killing millions of people today. I mean, uh, a lot of people think that the air in Chinese city is bad, but you want to see really bad air, you know, go and visit a subsistence farmer in Africa where they burn bad quality, low-quality fuel in their household. And this is much worse than the worst air that you will breed in China. I mean, low-quality indoor uh, fuel kills millions of people every year. It's one of the greatest environmental tragedies we have. But the best way to address that in uh, less advanced economies is to give these people the opportunity to burn kerosene and eventually to switch to uh, carbon fuel. So carbon fuels, uh, affordable energy, have made it possible to reforest the landscape. I mean, in every country that is at the level of development of Chile and higher, either the forest has made a, a comeback because, again, we produce a lot more food on a lot less land than in the past. And so a lot of agricultural land has reverted. Uh, to uh, forest, and this is true also in places like China, where the adoption of, again, uh, well, it's mostly a coal-based economy, but the, uh, the um, adoption of uh, carbon fuels has allowed a lot of landscape in uh, China to be reforested, but it has also improved the quality of life of people in terms of improving indoor air quality drastically. So again, there's a neat story to be told there, um, which just needs to be told better, I guess. People don't realize uh, how affordable and abundant energy increased dramatically human uh, productivity and the capacity to do things uh, with, uh, to do more with less resources, which in uh, the end has ended up drastically reducing uh, humanity's footprint uh, on the environment. And I mean, in, I mean, footprint is is it's a term I kind of steer clear from because it's, yeah. I mean, there's the human environment and the, the non-human environment. But the thing you said about doing more with less. I think one thing that's not realized enough is that human beings want a good environment to live in. And thus, one of the things they do when they have more work capacity is to dramatically improve their surroundings, whether to clean them up or to build them up into something that's much, much more uh, comfortable than what they had before, which was generally very uncomfortable and disease-ridden and dirty. Yeah, well, I apologize for the use of the term footprint. What can I say? Professional deformation. That's how. Uh, you're in Canada, so. Yeah, no, not only that, I'm a geographer, so that doesn't help either. No, and that's the thing. I mean, people don't realize again how uh, keeping horses, for example, in cities uh, was the best way to create major public health problems. I mean, uh, I assume uh, most of your listeners, or at least many of them, have seen a horse do its business. I mean, the amount of urine that comes out of a horse every day uh, was really awful. And then, uh, you know, you would have a horse excrement, which would sort of dry up and then be kind of depulverized, blown by the wind. I mean, people would breed this stuff. Uh, there's a reason why life in city historically was so much unhealthier than it is today. And so one of the greatest boons that uh, carbon fuel did was to get, uh, I'm quoting from memory here, but I think around 1900, there were something like 21 million horses and 5 million mules in American cities, or at least in both cities and uh, the countryside. Well, uh, these, things, these animals were very useful to produce crop, but they ate about a fifth of the American crop. And in cities, they were a tremendous source of problem. I mean, one of the world's first uh, urban planning congress was devoted to the study of horse manure because people were like, well, we can't keep growing cities. I mean, horses were just swimming in horse manure and 
we now we have the germ theory of disease. We understand how bad this whole thing is. So we need to move beyond that. And uh, you know, the story is that the the, the uh, urban planning uh, conference was sort of uh, cut short because people said, well, there's no way we can grow cities, so we need to decentralize things. But of course. Then eventually the internal combustion engine was developed. A few years later, the diesel engine came along. So tractors uh, were working year-round. They were never sick. You did not need to feed them when you were not uh, using them. And so agricultural productivity shot up, not only because of tractors, but it, it helped a lot. Cities became a lot cleaner, despite how dirty the uh, earliest uh, car uh, exhaust fumes were. But um, again, abundant energy has just made our environment so much cleaner, uh, you know, plastic packaging, protecting food from germs. I mean, a lot less people today die of food diseases than was the case uh, 100 years ago, perhaps uh, 100 times less, according to some numbers I've seen. So, uh, again, people should remember that uh, most human beings don't go out of their way to invent stuff if there's not a good reason for it. I mean, inventors go about uh, seeing things in different ways than others. They notice problems where others are happy with the status quo. And they come up with better, or if you would rather say it that way, uh, less damaging things of doing things than what existed before they came along. And abundant energy was really crucial in that respect. Yeah, I would definitely say better. Um, but uh, one quick question, and then I, I want to talk uh, a little bit about a book that you've been uh, working on. But just can you give just a quick summary of even pre-industrial, so people have a concrete image of their mind. What was, what was our environment like in terms of just the, the baseline, you know, the kind of air you were breathing, the kind of water you were drinking, the kind of food you were surrounded with? Sure. Because it's hard to get away from this idyllic picture of, oh, it, it yeah. was also yeah, wonderful until we messed it up. Yeah, it seems to me many of my students uh, get their image or at least their notion of what life was like in the countryside in the pre-industrial age by, you know, the first few minutes of the Lord of the Ring movie, uh, Tolkien and no, but that's the thing. I mean, uh, first of all, uh, the environment was uh, deforested the world over. I mean, if you look at Vermont 150 years ago, it's almost entirely deforested because you're grazing sheep or you're producing oats for horses and stuff like that. Uh, with deforestation, especially in places that are not very suitable to grow food, you have severe erosion problems. So you have a lot of siltation um, well, for example, if you go to Turkey or on some Greek islands, you will see that some large cities are kind of located uh, four kilometers inland. But then you learn, well, no, this used to be a port at one point in time. Well, what happened is that people deforested the landscape. Uh, there was a lot of erosion that happened. And uh, the port area essentially became filled with dirt. And you look at the landscape around today, it's kind of very desolated. This is not the way it used to be. Then the food that people ate, was really not great. I mean, wherever you were located, uh, the most subsistence, uh, well, maybe I should keep that for the, for the food part, the, the book food part, but uh, the, the food was very not nutritious compared to what you had today. You had all sorts of vitamins and minerals uh, deficiencies. Cities were extremely dirty. You had horse manure. You did not have sewers. You did not have clean water. So cholera epidemics uh, were common. Uh, you had all sorts of uh, yeah, contaminated, uh, contagious diseases. People were burning a low-quality fuel. They could barely afford a change of clothes. They did not have uh, hot running water. All the things that we take for granted today. And uh, it's sad to say, but uh, even if you go back to our three centuries in Europe, the life expectancy then was lower than it is in most less advanced economies today, which despite the fact that they're still poor compared to advanced economies, have nonetheless benefited from a lot of technologies like cheap plastic jars that I was telling you about or, uh, you know, uh, trucks that can move water, uh, decent quality water around. That did not exist in Europe uh, back in the days. So, no, the, the uh, life in the past was really uh, nasty, brutish, and short, poor, uh, ridden with uh, people who were always struggling with diseases. There were recurring epidemics, uh, high, very high infant mortality. And life in the countryside was not much fun because as soon as people got the opportunity, they moved either to cities or else they moved to North America or other places at a time where uh, even bef before the advent of uh, steamboats where crossing the Atlantic was uh, an extremely dangerous uh, proposition. So I'm not quite sure about the specific history of my ancestors. They were kind of late comers by a Canadian, uh, French Canadian standard. I mean, uh, they came in all, only in the early 18th century. But trust me, life in France, I mean, France of all places is so beautiful where food is so abundant, where the climate is so temperate. Uh, life in France must have, been, must have been pretty bad for my ancestor to live the mid-Atlantic coast 
and end up in the St. Lawrence Valley. So I think just that little story probably tells you how not fun life was, even in a place like early 18th century uh, mid-Atlantic France. Uh, just to round it out, can you say something about air quality? Oh, yeah, sure. No, well, air quality was much worse than it is today. Uh, again, uh, people think that uh, we have it so much worse today with smog problems and what have you, but a car today pollutes on a per unit basis about only 1% one, uh, 1% of what it did a few decades ago and a lot less uh, than uh, at the early, in the early 20th century. So I've already told you about horses, so people don't realize how having horses around would make sure that you know pulverized horse manure uh, transmitted all sorts of diseases. Uh, people were burning low-quality fuel, so air pollution in cities was much worse a century and a half ago than it was. Then coal came along. Coal was a progress, but I teach a lecture on air quality where I show what uh, air quality was like in Toronto uh, a century ago. And you see pictures that are uh, very dark, not because they're black and white, but because everything is covered with soot. Burning coal was progress over what existed before, but it was still incredibly filthy uh, compared to the burning natural gas or using electricity uh, as we do today. So yeah, actually, uh, air quality began to improve in the early 20th century when things like fuel oil became available, you know, fuel that is... Uh, too heavy and too dirty to be burned in cars or uh, in diesel engines, but that could be uh, burned in the home furnaces. And then electricity, well, you could sort of get the coal out of the city by creating a coal-fired plant that would then uh, produce electricity that was sent to cities. So uh, the air quality we have today that we enjoy, even in a place like Los Angeles, is incomparably better than what it would have been uh, a century ago. And uh, so, sure, if you go to China today or in less advanced economies, you can. that's the first thing you smell when you get out of the airplane, how bad air quality is there. But again, people are willing to put up there just as they were in the 19th century because things were even worse before. And eventually, only wealthy economies uh, can clean up their act and care about things like air quality. So uh, we've made tremendous progress. And again, people who think uh, we have it bad today, well, things are not perfect. We still struggle with smog even in a place like Toronto. But compared to what things were a century and even two or three centuries before, uh, air quality is incomparably better uh, than it used to be, and it is getting better over time. Yeah, I, I like the the realism about that because it's it's I mean like like an economy, an environment is a, is a progressive thing. So it's something that's getting better and better. But it's always important to remember what we're coming from and how how grateful. We should be. Which um, let's let's transition though to your book. Tell us about that. Yes. Well, okay. So it's kind of a it was kind of a continuation of what I've been doing. So for fifty for fifteen years now, I've been writing about uh, you know how human have used the landscape, how uh, past energy forms have been dirty, how people always find ways to turn problems into opportunities in the industrial realm. So in essence, saying to people that well, it might seem counterintuitive, but with technological change, entrepreneurship. You can both have your cake uh, and eat it too. You can have more wealth and a cleaner environment. And then a few years ago, I mean, I was busy with other things. I didn't want to, to do it, but uh, I got dragged into this whole local food debate. So I assume most of your listeners are familiar with the fact that in the last, well, it began really two decades ago, but it has really uh, exploded in the last decade, I would argue. Uh, we're, we're, we're being told that industrial food is uh, killing us, that... Uh, Long-distance transportation is unsustainable, that we're burning all this diesel and uh, marine bunker fuel and moving things around, and that this is just really awful. Why don't we go back to uh, the kind of food that our great-grandmothers uh, ate a century uh, or something ago? And then again, uh, I came to this issue uh, with the background I have. And to be honest, though, I got into it because of my wife, who happens to be my co-author on that. So she was born and raised in Tokyo. And uh, one evening, I took her uh, to listen to a prominent uh, exponent of that view. Uh, truth be told, I only did that because he was invited by my department, so I had to be there. And at one point, he said, uh, well, you know, uh, long-distance trade in food is awful. Some people are so parasitical on other parts of the planet, and the most parasitical people on Earth are, are the Japanese. And so, of course, at that point, I have to restrain my wife who wants to sort of make a big fuss. But uh, so I heard about the local food movement. I, I, I knew intuitively that it was wrong. I just didn't really have the time to look into it. But then, you know, my wife dragged me into it, kicking and screaming. 
And eventually we wrote a policy paper that had enough success that we got a book deal out of it. So anyway, the book is coming out in June, and in a sense it asks the same basic questions. Well, if things were so great during our great-grandmother's time, why did we develop the globalized food supply chain in the first place? And why is it that what people ate a century ago was actually very different than what their own great-grandmothers would have been eaten, eating, let's say, another 125 years before that? And so, in essence, we look at all the claims that are made uh, by local food activists. I won't get into the details here, but obviously none of it, uh, none of them uh, holds up to uh, historical scrutiny. So, for example, they will tell you that uh, eating local food heals the earth because we move things, uh, we stop moving things over long distances. But again, they forget that when people were producing food locally, they were, as I was explaining before, Uh, doing really bad things to their environment. I mean, growing food in an environment in which uh, growing that food is not suitable will lead to severe uh, erosion problems. The reason why people bother growing uh, wheat in Argentina and, uh, let's say, Western Canada to ship it back to Europe is that you would produce more uh, more wheat. And the reason why you would produce more wheat is because uh, the land was more suitable for that. So you would have less erosion problems and you would be able to produce more food for less money. Ship it to uh, Europe. Uh, ship it to urban consumer uh, markets in Europe, and in the process, provide more affordable food. So, uh, and helping poor people eat a more varied and abundant diet, while actually uh, producing less environmental uh, damage in the process. Then people tend to forget that, uh, and it's very funny. I think the most ironic thing about this whole movement is that local food activists really worship diversity in all its form. But then you tell them, well, okay, so by producing local food, essentially what you want to do is put all your agricultural eggs in the same regional basket. And another uh, big impulse historically to develop the globalized food supply trade is that bad things will happen in agricultural production. You produce things outdoors, you're very uh, dependent on what nature throws at you, so you might have a drought uh, or just not enough water one year, or then you might have, as we have in Toronto this year, uh, the weather has been extremely warm, uh, in February, uh, things have begun growing faster, and then we're sort of back to winter conditions, or at least much colder conditions. Uh, historically, this was very problematic in terms of food. Your local crops might fail because of that. And so, uh, again, uh, the long-distance traded food made uh, food more abundant. And then, uh, with the development of the steam, uh, steam uh, ships first, and then in more recent time, intermodal container shipping, We've become very efficient at moving uh, food over long distances using very little energy. I mean, a boat floats on water. It's uh, powered by uh, low-quality fuel using diesel engines. I mean, it is extremely efficient. Uh, Moving things halfway around the world on a boat consumes very little energy compared to, let's say, uh, taking your car, going to the supermarket, buying a few things, bring them back home. It might be that moving these same items halfway around the world on a container ship took less energy than you taking uh, your car to go buy a few items and bringing them back uh, to your house. Uh, The globalized food supply chain has made food a lot more abundant and a lot more diverse than it was before. And it's the best thing. I mean, there are two things then that uh, local food activists need to uh, answer if they want to say that modern technology and long distance transportations are bad. The first is that if everything is killing us, if this fossil fuel grown food that we eat is so bad for us, How come we live longer and healthier lives than our ancestors? I mean, um, in advanced economies a century ago, the average life expectancy in the United States was 47 years of age. Now, granted, this was due uh, in large part to high infant mortality. But then, uh, again, with better food, with more abundant energy, uh, child mortality went down a lot. And in advanced economies, they were almost living 80 years of age. So if things are bad, if things were so great in the past, how come we live longer and healthier lives? And again, if uh, long distance uh, trade in food is bad, well, how come uh, so much more of uh, the land in advanced economies today is uh, reforested compared to what it was in the past? So anyway, the the book is a long discussion of every myth put forward uh, by uh, local food activists saying that, uh, for example, local food um, really nurtures social capital, but you look at why brands, for example, uh, developed historically. Well, it was to create actually some trust between the people who were selling the food and the people who were buying it. You could always trust a large firm more than somebody at your local farmer's market, it's sad to say. 
But again, the, the firms that succeeded, Heinz, uh, Quaker Oats, what have you, succeeded because they provided the best alternative at uh, the best price uh, that was then possible. And so again, uh, brands were a way to develop trust between consumers and uh, producers. And uh, then uh, food is a lot cheaper than it used to be. I mean, there was, I wouldn't call it a study, but somebody wrote a short piece recently comparing the price of food in London in 1851 to uh, 2011. And in over 150 years, you only pay now in real terms one thirteenth of what you would have paid for the same food in the middle of the 19th century. So again, modern medicine played a role, but we have a much more abundant, diverse, and cheaper food supply than in the past. And all of this was made possible by cheap energy and long-distance trade. And so, uh, Iroko, my wife, and I are just uh, trying to tell a little bit more about that history and help people today understand that, again, uh, economic development occurs for a reason. A lot of people pour a lot of energy into developing uh, better or less damageable ways of doing things. And nowhere is this clearer than in the world of food production and the quality of life, the increased quality of life that it has delivered over time. I mean, reverting to the world of yesterday will not get you back to the world of uh, Tolkien, of the Lord of the Ring or uh, of the Shire, but rather the miserable conditions that our ancestors were glad to have escaped from. Sequel. All right. So everyone needs to know where do they where do they find about more about the book and where do they find more about you? Oh, well, uh, my name is – well, I have a rather detailed website, so, uh, well, unfortunately, I'm French. Well, I'll post it. I'll, po I'll post well, your you website. Post it, so at, I have my own – yeah. Yeah, so I have my own personal website, so just Google my name, Pierre Bérochet. There are a few of us in Canada, but I'm usually the first one that pops up. And there will be a link uh, on the website, too, to the book, which is called The Locavore's Dilemma uh, in Praise of the 10,000-Mile Diet, which is due out uh, in June. <laughs> Uh, all right. That's great, Pierre. Uh, thank you so much uh, for coming on the program. Uh, I learned a ton, so I'm sure everyone else learned a ton as well. And um, I'm going to bug you to come on again another time. Oh, I'll be happy to be there as often as you want me. Trust me, that changes me from my interviews with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporations and other news outlets around uh, here. I can probably promise a consistently more friendly voice on the other side of the phone. All right. Thanks, Pierre, and uh, take care. Thanks, Alex. Bye.